Hey, welcome to Christian Life Church Online. Um, we are reading the book of Jonah this month and it is amazing. You will love it. So dive right in and read that story of fun. And uh, yeah, enjoy the message. Jesus Christ. 
this is just one thing that I, I got out um, of it, just in this round of, of reading. And um, basically the encouragement is believe. Believe. Like thoroughly believe in God, in the goodness of God, in the greatness of God. Just believe it, because He is it. He is God. And uh, so we're just going to have a little look at that in in and looking at a little bit of background to Jonah as well. Most people have heard the story of Jonah before, um, elements of it, and um, and I'll just try and uh, bring a little bit more perhaps background information for you if you haven't heard. So we're going to start at the start of Jonah um, in. Chapter 1, 1 to 3, this is what it says. The word of the Lord came to Jonah, son, son of Amittai. Go to the great city of Nineveh and preach against it, because its wickedness has come up before me. But Jonah ran away from the Lord and headed for Tarshish. He went down to Joppa, where he found a ship bound for that port. After paying the fare, he went aboard and sailed for Tarshish to flee from the Lord. Um, so... If you don't know, Nineveh was a, a big, big city. Um, wasn't the capital, but it was a really important city in Assyria. Assyria at the time was a was a growing empire, and they were continually expanding their borders and wanting to take over nations. And they were incredibly violent, brutal, um, cruel in and you know, rape and pillage everywhere they go. Here's a bit of archaeological um, um, background. Thing, background. background. This this was a, a carving of the Assyrians. Um, it, you've got an image here of them sacking some city. You've got the ladders going up, they're climbing up, they've got all of their, and they look all brave and wonderful and stuff. But then you've got the, whoever it is that they're attacking, you've got them being thrown off the top of the wall, upside down, heading, heading straight to the ground, and you've got guys at the bottom there ready to um, capture them. Then down here, if I had my little laser pointer, that would have been helpful. Down here, you've got images of slavery. Um, you've got them with their swords holding these guys who have their hands bound behind them. But the most horrible bit is here in the middle there, you've got the two guys behind them holding heads, mm. waving heads over the top of these slaves as if, uh, you know, flaunting and celebrating their um, violent overthrow of this place. And that is a pretty good image of um, the Assyrians. Now, it, at the time of Jonah, the Assyrians were building their empire, they were growing, they had actually taken some of the land of Israel. And so at this time, you've got this king, so um, Israel had been divided into two kingdoms at this point after King Solomon, then it got divided and you've got the lower, uh, the, the southern kingdom and the northern kingdom. The southern kingdom was then called Judah, and the northern kingdom was called Israel. Now, the king at this time, and the king of Israel, was Jeroboam II, and he was not a good guy. He did lots of evil things. Um, he did not listen to God, except for one thing, is that we see in 2 Kings 14, 25, where it's telling a little bit of the story, it talks about how, how Jeroboam II had taken back the land that had been uh, invaded. In accordance with the word of the Lord, the God of Israel, spoken through his servant Jonah, son of Amittai, the prophet from Gath Hepha. So, Jonah, it seems, has had some kind of audience with the king and had prophesied that this land that Assyria had taken was going to be claimed back. The king goes and does it, gets it back, everyone's happy, yay. Jonah would have been, most likely, celebrated as a good 
bloke and been honoured in some way for bringing this this word that would, um, you know, know, be beneficial for for Israel and King Jeroboam II. So he's, he's in a good space with them. That kind of gives a bit more of a better understanding then when God says, okay, you know how you took the land back from Assyria, your enemy, um, that was great that that happened, but now I want you to go and preach to them. He's like, no, I'm not going to. Here we've got a little map, Google map, uh, Google Earth, um, gives a little bit of an indication Here's Israel there. This is where he's meant to be going, about 700 k's away. So that's a, that's a decent trip, isn't it? Where's, what's 700 k's from here? What would you say? Newcastle. Newcastle? Yeah. Let's go with Newcastle. Maybe. So, I mean, that's a long journey on a donkey. <laughs> if he was traveling by donkey. Wow. That would take a while. But he's not going to do it, doesn't want to do it. He wants to go as far away as he can. Now, there's no clear, like, absolute, concrete evidence as to where Tarshish was. There's a few hints through different kind of um, things that were written down in different places. So, the two most likely, one was on this little island here, 3,000 k's away. Um, and the other one that's most recognized and most talked about is in Spain, over here, nearly three and a half thousand k. So that's about from the east coast to the west coast of Australia. Uh, that's, a, that's a pretty big trip. This is, this is, Jonah is desperate to get away from Assyria. He does not want to preach to the Assyrians. He wants to get as far away as he can. Uh, you most likely know the story that as he's going in the ship, there's this big, big storm. It's terrible. It's scary. The, the crew are absolutely freaked out. And they, they say, well, this must be the, someone's upset at God because this is, this is shocking. Talk to Jonah. Jonah says, yeah, no, it's my fault. Yeah, I know. Yeah, because I worship the God. Um, the God who created the ocean and the dry land. And they're like, no, what did you do? It's just, if you throw me over, it'll all stop. So they throw him over, it all stops. They go, oh, we need to worship this God. So they change, but Jonah is sinking. God sends a big fish to swallow him. And while he's in this fish, still alive, he then prays, um, and he gets vomited back up onto dry land. And so again, God says, okay, go and preach now. Say what I want you to say. So Jonah obeyed the word of the Lord and went to Nineveh, proclaiming, 40 more days and Nineveh will be overthrown. The Ninevites believed God. A fast was proclaimed and all of them, from greatest to least, put on sackcloth. And that was a symbol of repentance of the, we have done the wrong thing. We recognize our guilt. We are just... Laying, laying down all dignity right now to say, forgive me, please. We want to change. Um, so key in this is the Ninevites believed God. And I was thinking about it, you know, and I was wondering about this, you know, here comes this bloke who just starts walking around the city and it takes three days to walk around, but in the process of him walking around and saying this stuff, the whole city turns in repentance and um, it could be just that the spirit of God was on his words that had just cut to their heart and they knew it was true but I wanted to and this is just I guess speculation um, I, I heard once that they worshipped a fish god and so I thought I'd look into that and um, sure enough there's this dog that dog <laughs> God called Dagon, um, which you might, perhaps if you know the story of, um, of David and Goliath, the Philistines, they worshipped Dagon. There was this amazing moment where they stopped, the, the Philistines had stolen the Ark of the Covenant and taken it and stuck it in front of this statue of Dagon. And in the morning, Dagon was face down, 
head broken off and arms broken off, lying in front of the, um, the Ark of the Covenant, they freaked out and said, take it back. <laughs> um, which is just super cool. But in this, so um, the Assyrians also worshipped Dagon. There's a poem that was written, um, it was about 300 years before Jonah, and it says, uh, this is from Wikipedia, it says in an Assyrian poem, Dagon um, appears beside Nergal and Misharu, how we say that, as a judge of the dead. And that is a that is a Assyrian piece of carving showing this fish god, um, half fish, half man. So they had this this um, I guess a, a worship or reverence for this god that they believed in Dagon, who who judges judges the dead and was this fish god, right? God in all of his wisdom, so this is my, perhaps it's just my speculation perhaps, and that's okay if I'm wrong, but my thought is that God works all this, throws, throw, uh, sends this great fish to grab Jonah. One of the words that Jonah says when he's in the fish, he says this, from, the deep, from deep in the realm of the dead, remember Dagon is a judge of the dead, I called for help and you listened to my cry. The fish vomits him up. And then he goes and preaches. And I wonder, I just wonder, did he tell his story? Like in his anger about the fact that he had to go, did he say, you know, I tried to get away from you, but I got thrown over because of this storm and I got swallowed by this fish. And when I was in the realm of the dead, I called for help. And the fish vomited me up and I was told to come and preach to you. Would that be just speaking right to their culture where they had been worshipping Dagon and it was this image of the, the God of this Jonah is actually greater than Dagon because when he was in the realm of the dead, this God caused him to vomit him back up. So whether there was all that going on as well, or whether it was just the Spirit of God that was, that was in the words that he was saying, uh, whatever it was, they recognised that God is ultimate. And this is what I want to come to. This is, you know, in my reading of Jonah this time around, these are just my thoughts. Recognising, first of all, God is ultimate. He is ultimate in wisdom. Jeremiah 10, 12, but God founded the world by his wisdom and stretched out the heavens by his understanding. Everything of the complexity of creation came from the wisdom of God. Nothing that is here is beyond his like, whoa, how does that work? Because <laughs> he made it to be like that. His wisdom is extraordinary. He is ultimate in power. Again, Jeremiah 32, 17. Ah, sovereign Lord, you have made the heavens and the earth by your great power and outstretched arm. Nothing is too hard for you. There is no power in all of the universe that is greater than the power of God because all of the universe came from the power of God. He is ultimate in power. He is ultimate in holiness. We have this story in Isaiah 6. Three, Isaiah has a vision of God in his temple and he sees this um, crazy creatures called seraphim flying overhead and they were calling to one another holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty the whole earth is full of his glory Isaiah in that moment is just so petrified of the holiness of God and by that it means his perfection in love he is so perfect. And Isaiah realized he was not anything nearly perfect. And he just freaked out and said, I'm going to die. I'm going to die. I'm going to die. And uh, he said, because I'm a man of unclean lips. And something had to happen in order to cleanse him, in order to stay in the presence of God. God is ultimate in all ways. And so this is what I think is the, the, the agenda, God's agenda for all humanity. 
We have the reality of God. The reality of God's greatness is ultimateness, is supremacy. That is meant to result in belief. He is everything greater than, like you think of when, when, you know, Moses sees this bush that's on fire, but it's not burning up. And he's intrigued by it and he, he leans forward and when God sees him come towards it, he calls out. And starts talking to him. And in the conversation at one point he says, well, who, who am I meant to say is sending me? And his answer is like, I don't know, I just think of movies in those moments where there's that bass drop in the sound where it just goes, and you see the, you know, the rings of power just go, and kind of, you know. And God's, God's response, and I think it's one of those moments where he just says, I am. <laughs> he doesn't have to, like, Oh, do I give you a name or this? Oh, just tell him that it's me. He just says, I am who I am. I am. I exist. I am the God of all. No name can contain me. I am the ultimate. God's intention, his desire, his agenda is that we would come to the space of belief in the greatness of who he is. And that belief will immediately result in repentance. Because it's not just a belief that, oh yeah, God's there. No. Yeah, that's cool. No, it's like a belief in the awesomeness of God will result in us going, whoa, I've, I, I am changing my life because I see that you are who you are. And the result of all that is a restoration of life because you're, you're aligning yourself with the author of life himself. Restoration takes place. Restoration with your relationship with God, but restoration inwardly as well of, that comes out of that relationship. Things line up the way they're meant to this is God's agenda for the world, that we see the reality of Him, that we believe Him, that results in us changing our life to line up with Him and restoration takes place so that we are who we've been created to be. This is God's agenda. So, Thinking about it, thinking about how Jonah went to Nineveh, um, the reality is that those Ninevites, they needed to encounter the reality of God. How are they going to change their behavior or even believe in God if they haven't even encountered the reality of God? It's not just a thing of hearing, like he say, oh yeah, there's a God. No, in, in, the Ninevites did not repent. They did not believe until they encountered the reality of God in Jonah's preaching. People need to encounter the reality of God for his agenda of belief, repentance and restoration to take place. So just one question that could be asked that some people might ask is, well, why doesn't God just show himself fully to the whole world? Bam, and boom, there he is, bang, in all of his glory, and then everyone will believe. I imagine that there'd be a number of answers that you could give to that, and I'm just going to give one that I was thinking of, but this is what I think. God wants loving relationship. And relationship requires curiosity and pursuit. Think about meeting someone new. The first things you do in order to start, start building an acquaintance that turns into a relationship is you ask questions. Oh, where are you from? Do you live around here? Are you out of town? Town, oh, what do you do? Blah blah. You just keep asking questions because you're curious because you want to start understanding who is this person that's in front of me. And then relationship will only happen if there's a continued pursuit of 
I want to continue to be close to you. I want to get closer. Let's go have coffee together. Let's, you know, there's a there's that process. And we know that in relationships, maybe one thing that can go wrong is when curiosity leaves the relationship. You stop asking questions. You stop trying to find out something about the other person. And you just become complacent. And then there's this, this dryness in the relationship. Curiosity, I think, is a really good key to healthy relationships. And the pursuit. So in regards to Jonah going to Nineveh, um, you know, why didn't God just go, Ooh, why did he have to send Jonah there? Um, well, I think it was, God is always the initiator, so he does something that should tweak our curiosity and the desire to pursue. When that happens, then there's this back and forth thing going on. And I think even just that example before of, of Moses at the burning bush, he sees the bush. It specifically says, when God saw that he turned towards the bush, then he spoke. He's burning. He does the initiating. Moses looks, sees it, and is curious. So he leans in towards it. God sees that. This is the... The nature of a relationship, and he's like, Oh, you beauty. And it says, Hey, Moses, come over here, take your sandals off because you're on holy ground right now. And then begins this conversation and the back and forth thing going on. Um, even though Moses was a bit silly in it, God continued this relationship and then used Moses in the most extraordinary way. But it was based on a relationship that started because of God initiating and Moses being curious. And I think this is how God works. How are people going to be curious if they haven't had an encounter with God to start with? And here we've got this verse, everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. And that is the good news. That is the good news of the gospel. Everyone. Everyone. No matter what your background is, no matter what your status is in society, no matter what anything, everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. But then it goes on. How? Then can they call on the one that they have not believed in? How can they believe in the one whom they have not heard? And how can they hear without someone preaching to them? People often quote Francis of Assisi who said that, this is my paraphrase because I'm not going to get perfectly right, but he said basically, um, preach the gospel always and use words when necessary. I'm not the biggest fan of that. Like Francis of Assisi, great bloke, did amazing things, said a lot of good things, but I don't love that quote because it tends to lean towards our um, fear of, I don't want to say the wrong thing, I don't want to say stuff, so I'll just be a good person and that'll preach the gospel to them. But can I just remind you that if I'm a really kind guy to my neighbor, my neighbor will probably say, gee, he's a kind guy. He probably won't say, I need to give my life to Jesus. Unless I tell him about Jesus. So being kind is great. It's right because Jesus is kind. I'm meant to be displaying it in my life. But people are not going to have the full re revelation of Jesus unless someone tells them. But I love... What Paul says about preaching, when he's, he's saying, you know, he in Romans, he's saying to the Romans, you've got to be preaching this message. How can people respond to God unless they hear? But then in Corinthians, he says this, my message and my preaching were not with wise and persuasive words, but with the demonstration of the Spirit's power, so that your faith might not rest on human wisdom, but on God's power. I have heard multiple people say, I'm not really comfortable with talking to other people about God because I don't know enough. Mm. Well, Paul knew a lot. But he was saying, I'm choosing not to use the, the wisest and most persuasive words. I'm going to use a demonstration of the Spirit's power so that people aren't resting on my words but they're resting on the reality of God that they see in front of them. 
And we know that his ministry was filled with the most extraordinary miracles and uh, signs and wonders, prophetic gifting, um, words of knowledge, all of those kinds of things, which are a demonstration of the Spirit's power. And just a reminder, you have the Spirit of God in you if you have surrendered to Jesus. And every day we need to be asking, Holy Spirit, empower me, come upon me to be able to do the things you're calling me to do so that people can see the reality of God. People need to encounter the reality of God. And that God's agenda is that that would then turn into belief, repentance, restoration. That's his heart. That's his desire. Unfortunately, it doesn't always go that way. If you do the most amazing miracle, it doesn't mean someone's going to give their life to Jesus. Even if you say, this is Jesus who did it. And Matthew 11, I think it's about verse 25, Jesus is saying, Woe to you guys in Chorazin, because if the miracles were done, that were done with you in Tyre and Sidon, they would have repented in sackcloth and ashes. And he says it again to, to other places, Capernaum. Woe to you, Capernaum, because if the miracles happened there, Sodom, if they saw the, if Sodom saw the miracles you saw, they would have repented. It still all comes down to the, the individual's decision. What are they going to do with this reality of God? God's desire is that it will result in belief, but it is up to the person to then respond to God. But how do they have a chance to respond to God unless someone is giving them the opportunity to respond to the reality of God? So what do we do? First of all, believe in God. Believe in God. Obviously, the first step is that initial, Jesus, I believe in you. I believe that what you did on the cross was to deal with my sin. I need you to forgive me. That's the start. But you know, belief in God doesn't just stop there. I love that phrase in the Gospels where the bloke is responding to Jesus says, I do believe, help my unbelief. And I think this should be a prayer every day. God, I do believe, help my unbelief. Help my unbelief. I want a full belief in the full massiveness of the greatness of our God. Because if that really grabs my heart, my life will continue to be more and more of a reflection of total trust in His goodness and the joy of the fact that I can see Him interact in our lives. Believe in God. That is the first step. Second step. Ask the Holy Spirit to keep you aware of God's agenda. His agenda, his desire, is that people will see the reality of who he is and turn in belief. If we keep that at the forefront of our thinking, then we'll more likely do this next step, which is pray for courage to actively join in. Join in with God's agenda of giving people the opportunity to encounter the reality of God. And you know, even in the teaching that the school of ministry people had it of healing, um, great example of people encountering the reality of God. Trust the leading and empowering of the Holy Spirit. And I will just say on that, there was a time where I knew that I needed this, the Holy Spirit's empowering. So I would pray for it. But I would wait. I'd be waiting for this moment of feeling the power. And then I would go out. You know, I, I, I'd say, I'm going to go out when I feel the power. But um, I think the reality of faith, I think Peter getting out. Did he feel a power surge that he knew I can walk on water? Or did he just do it because 
Jesus said, come on. He's like, okay. Steps out. Whoa, look at the water. And then he freaks out. But it, it, did he feel this? I'm powerful and I can step out on water. Yeah, look at me go. No, I don't think he did. I think he just did it because Jesus said, come on. When we think of um, Sonny this morning in communion gave um, or used the, the Great Commission at the end um, where it says, Jesus speaking to his disciples about to go back into heaven, he says, all authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations. It says, you know, baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey everything that I commanded you. And I am with you until the very end of the age. If we split that into three separate messages, we could be quite happy with that. You know, Jesus has all authority. Go and make disciples. He's going to be with us always. Yay. It's one, one paragraph. He says, I have all authority. All authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. So now I'm going to tell you to do something because I am, I am all authority. Go and make disciples of all nations. And I will be with you to the end. You know, we want to experience God's presence. We love it when we experience God's presence. Well, in that context, he's saying, as you're going, making disciples, you will experience my presence because I'll be with you in that to the very end. That's what the, that's what the paragraph looks like when you actually put it all together. His presence will be with you. His empowering presence will be with you as you go and make disciples of all nations. So we need to trust the leading and the empowering. But don't just wait for a sense of, oh yeah, I feel God's power now. He's actually already said, go and make disciples. So as you step out in obedience to what he's already said, you will experience God in it. Take the risk. You know it's always scary to talk about Jesus to people who don't know Jesus. You know that it is. There's always, for me, there's always that little, you know, the adrenaline starts going, you feel a bit nervous, how are they going to take it, how do I do this? Oh. So don't wait for that to be not there. Because it's not going to not be there. This is the essence of faith. You take the risk. It's a risk. But can I just say that when someone responds positively, oh my gosh, the rush of joy that just fills you. It's the joy of the Lord just fills you like nearly not much else. When someone responds to you talking about Jesus and they go, oh, I'd like to know more or whatever it is, man, it's the best reward in terms of chemicals in the brain. <laughs> it's a good feeling. Don't wait for there to be no nerves. Don't wait for a moment where you think, okay, now I understand everything so I can actually say stuff. <coughs> Mm -mm. Even Jesus um, said, don't worry about what to say. Just because God will give you the words there. So this is the encouragement I get from the book of Jonah. God's agenda is that we encounter his reality, that we, that we respond in belief and repentance that turns our hearts in restoration. And... Um, and he wants us to then take the, take the encounters out to other people because his agenda is that everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. But how can they hear unless someone's proclaiming the message? You know, Jonah got really angry at the end. He like wished he could die, but it was most likely because his reputation was shot. He'd just gone from the king who was 
giving him accolades for the fact that they've taken back land off these Assyrians and now he's gone to the enemy and they repented and God gave them grace. He has to come back to this country now and face the king who was not a good king. He was not in a happy space. He did not understand the fullness of God's agenda for the world. God wants us to, to grab hold of his heart and he just wants people. He wants people. He wants people. He wants them. So have you got any questions about that or anything of about Jonah or anything or comments or whatever? What comes to mind? Well, Daniel, um, who was in the, the uh, yes, yeah, so the question being, is it miraculous that he survived a fish? Is that even possible that there could be a fish that big that could do that? Um, sorry, a few years ago, it was quite a wild country. It did happen to a, a bloke. In Spain. Got swallowed. What sort of fish? I don't know. But the same thing happened. A guy got swallowed by a fish? Yes. I he, looked it up he, got, he got spitted out. He, um, they got him, I don't know if he spit out or got him out of the stomach anyway. He was alive anyway. Yeah. There you go. So, where did you say that was? You looked it up in Spain. I saw two reports. One, the fish died from constipation. <laughs> <laughs> and wow. he was alive after four days in the fish. Four days? <gasps> yeah. Wow. yeah. So, there you go. So, there's that report. That, that was one. Spain. And then the Spain one was a fisherman. Like, not that long ago. A fisherman got swallowed. Mm. Not so long ago. That's the last one. Is it yeah. Four day one? No, the four day one was the constipated fish. Oh, okay. It was the 1800s. And oh, in the 1800s. But then the Spain one. Okay. okay. I'll write that down. I'll put so the Spain was not so long ago, no. just a couple yeah, of years yeah. ago. Yeah, oh, a few years ago. Yeah. Um, so there you go. So, yes. They were <laughs> both whales. Possible. They were both They were whales. whales. Oh, oh, okay. There's a difference. So this is saying it's a fish. Daniel in the last service had said that they. Um, He'd seen this thing of, they'd found this evidence. Uh, other, still exists or might be extinct, but it was this ginormous fish that had the capabilities of swallowing something that big. Um, so surviving in the, in the gut, well, I mean, that, that shows that it's possible to survive in the gut of a sea creature. Mm. Um, it would have been quite uncomfortable for him, I guess, that, well, both the Jonah and the fish. Breathe, yeah. Ooh. There must have been some air pocket in there for him to be able to breathe. But oh. on the funny side of things, that he hose down and he's just through it. Hose down. Yeah, that, that would have been. Yeah. yeah. Sweet. I'd say the smart thing out the sea. Any other questions? It's funny. I'll just say this. Different things, obviously, over, as time goes on, and these extraordinary things that we read of the Bible, that over the last mm. what, few years, it's, it's coming out that mm. are true. It, it can happen, mm. it does happen. Mm. And they can survive here, what is it? Yeah. And he's saying, but what I'm trying to say is so wonderful how the Holy Spirit brings the truth to light mm. in yeah. today's world. Yeah, yeah definitely. <laughs> yes. Um, Yeah, I haven't studied it, I don't know. Sorry, can't answer that question about casting lots. But it was, it was, um, it definitely was a custom um, at the time. But that's how you sort out tricky right from wrong, tricky situations. Mm -hmm. Even in the New Testament, they did it. Uh, trusting that God would steer it. Um, you should do that with the election. I, <laughs> I don't know. Uh, I wouldn't then take that as being, therefore, that's how we should make decisions. 
I think probably more God was gracious in those moments. <laughs> Not so much make a rule out of that's how we do it. Okay. Well, um, I'm going to pray for us. So God, we recognize you are ultimate and we know there's more for us to understand in that, more for us to believe in your greatness and we want to believe, help our unbelief. We do believe in you, God. Help our unbelief. And, um, and God, we ask that you would be keeping us aware of your agenda. You just want people to be in relationship with you, to believe you, that you are who you are. Help us remember that that's your agenda. Give us the courage to actively join in with your agenda. Help us to trust the leading and empowering of the Holy Spirit in it. And, and uh, God, help us to just take the risk, step out, talk to people about your greatness. Give us the courage to pray for people, to see miracles happen. Because we know that it's not by our strength, but when you're with us, you can do anything. God, you love people. You love the people in this town. You love the people in this region. You love the people in this nation. You love the people in all of the world. And you want your children to rise up and bring your message of hope. To allow people to encounter your reality. To then respond to you. Help us join in with your agenda.